You're listening to the Strange Oddities Podcast. Please welcome your host, Matthew J. Pop. This is your podcast for Strange Things. We have a round table, normal round table The lineup's a little bit different tonight. Uh, we had some other guests that uh, didn't turn out, you know, uh, the schedule didn't turn out the way we wanted. But um, I ended up doing a last-minute uh, paranormal roundtable discussion. I have some really cool people on the show for tonight to make the conversation really interesting. You guys will love the conversation that we'll have. We're going to talk about everything in the paranormal, and uh, we'll have some fun. But let me get the boring stuff out of the way, guys, real quick. As always, we have a website, strangeoddiespodcast.wordpress.com. Um, I do have a new website. It's in the works, and it's on my Facebook page. You can follow the link there. Follow us on Facebook and on YouTube. Guys, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe kindly to our YouTube channel. And uh, we uh, basically multicast on different platforms, iTunes, Spotify, um, where else? Uh, no, we're everywhere. Wherever you can get podcasts. So, guys, we'll go ahead and get these awesome uh, people in the room here. Here we go, guys. There's uh, the four of us here now. We had more than that before, but, you know, things changed at the last minute, but that's all right. We'll have some fun with it. We have the Yacht Man, Ron Yacoveni from uh, Gone Yacht Paranormal. He's an ITC researcher, uh, very much into uh, anything ITC. Uh, they have the Facebook page, the ITC uh, Invisible Art. Check him out with uh, his partner and girlfriend, uh, Lourdes Gonzalez. Um, again, you know, she couldn't be here tonight. She wasn't feeling well, but I hope she feels better. Um, and then we have Katie Foreman on the bottom there. Katie, welcome to the Strange Oddities Podcast. How are you doing? Thank you. All right. And then we got Mr. Philip Wyatt here uh, with us tonight on the Strange Oddities Podcast. Um, I want to tell everybody uh, a little bit of background about you guys a little bit before we get going, uh, just so everybody kind of knows uh, who you guys are. I'm um, going to read off our... Thing here. First, I'll start with Katie. Uh, Miss Foreman here is the founder and organi- organizer of two paranormal teams, not just one, two. Uh, Cal Para Research, uh, based in Southern California, and Para Zona Research, uh, based in the Phoenix Valley of Arizona. Uh, KD has been contacted by spirits since she was uh, 10 years old. Uh, with over 30 years of paranormal research, she combines psychic impressions with modern scientific equipment to help her learn about life after death. Pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, And then we're going to go into Mr. Wyatt's uh, bio here real quick. And uh, here we go. Um, Mr. Wyatt, uh, no relation to Wyatt Earp, of course. (laughs) Um, Philip is an eventual eventual spirit medium and animal researcher and investigator with uh, the Mystery Center for Advanced Paranormal Phenomena, also known as MCATP. He has extensive background in the study of practice of ITC as well, also known as instrumental transformation. He combines his beliefs in the afterlife along with his gifts as a medium and together with science and technology uh, to establish the connection and communication uh, between the living and spirit. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that at that, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, get right into it. Um, you know, it, it's great to have everybody here for a paranormal roundtable discussion. Um, I'm excited. What, you know, we can talk about anything. It's an open forum night here on Strange Oddities Podcast. Um, I thought I'd throw a few topics out there, but then after that, we can just pretty much shoot the breeze about whatever. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I don't know, guys, uh, what's your thoughts on the current, with being that everybody's kind of in, into ITC here, what's your current thoughts on technology and where it's going uh, with ITC and comparing it to the way we used to deal with ITC? Um, I'll start with um, Mr. Philip Wyatt on the bottom. Um, 
Uh, technology. Okay, I'm echoing a little bit. Uh, the spirits love technology too, so they're adapting with us as we try new things. I mean, they're working as hard on that side as we are on this side to connect. So anything new that comes along that we want to experiment with, I'm sure they're willing to do it. You just need to understand what it is you're using and doing to make sure you're getting valid responses and not um, just wishful thinking. But um, I, spirit will communicate any way that they can, in my opinion. If they want to talk, they'll use Radio Shack Radio. They'll use the hum of a washing machine. If they want to talk, they're going to talk. That's my personal opinion. So uh, technology, I'm for anything that doesn't have any programmed words, misleading phrases. I don't care if they're run backwards, forwards, sideways. I don't want a word in an ITC app. But I love technology. If it blinks, goes off, lights up, talks, I love it. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to KD next. Um, Ron's going to give us a nice cool explanation of ITC when we go to Ron, but I'm going to uh, ladies before Ron. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> Nothing. As you uh, should. I, I like uh, I like the creative things that can come out. Our tech guy just took a rim pod and he's changing it into a what we're calling a spirit whiteboard at this time. So across the top um, are erasable white discs that you can write on. And so you can change the rim pod um, to say whatever the context is of the current investigation, uh, east, north, southwest, you can write that on the top of these white chips on the top of the rim pod. Male, female, old, young, uh, whatever you're currently investigating, it's... Um, it's sort of in my mind, it's the next advancement for a rim pod, being able to um, help a spirit isolate to one area and answer and everything. So I like when we're getting creative. Uh, I see a lot of repeats out there in different boxes. So uh, you can buy the same object in, you know, five different versions and everything. And um, that's helpful i just think that like philip said um they'll step up if we can step up and so i'm excited excited to see advancements in that area you know again without the pre-programmed words um because i have witnessed too many times uh, you know forcing the fit in and stuff cool that's my opinion <laughs> You're entitled, absolutely. Yeah, no, cool. Um, okay, Ron, your thoughts. Well, to to, to, to jump off what Katie said, which is what I, I really I found totally agreeable and, and completely true, there are uh, retreads and reinventions, and part of that is the the innovative minds in the field who are trying to come up with their own spin on something that's already done, not necessarily reinventing the wheel. But when this became more mainstream, when this became more publicly accepted than it used to be when it was under the negative halo. What happens is, is also is that it becomes a marketplace and then you have a target audience and a demographic. And so you right. There's money to be made. And so you have, you have an opportunity to come up with your version of the, whatever it is, you know? And so that's part of where, where that comes from. I like the juxtaposition between the technology and progress and then technology, and then where there's still either a lack of progress or where there's also still uh, unanswered questions that still loom and that we still don't know. Like we don't know any more about how the EVP gets onto the device than we did before. We know it happens. We find different ways of doing it. We find ways to vet the authenticity of the catch, but how it happens, we still don't know. Um, there are theories that suggest that, that, that our, our environment alone, our bodies, the equipment we use, provide enough energy to modulate like electrical fields or currents that were probably around all the time. And it really doesn't take a lot of energy to modulate a, an audio circuit. So minute in comparison to how much waste heat the devices that we use alone give off. So we may be even unintentionally with the things we're using, helping bolster the results we're getting in other things. And I like what Katie said, that gentleman should get 
uh, credit because that's an innovative idea. You're taking something and making it corroborate even further what it already does as, a, as an EMF reader or, you know, creating a field that will measure if there's a disturbance or not. So my concern is that um, when they have new products that they create, what evidence can we compare it to to make sure that we may get some sort of response, for instance, uh, coming out with reverse recording machines, um, automatically going to reverse record. What evidence can you compare that to that that's, you may get something, it may sound like something, how right. do we know it is something, you yep. know? That's brilliant. That's one of the reasons for people watching too. I, I started investigating on it on the West Coast. So I got the chance to work with Katie before. She is as good as it gets as, as an investigator on location. Thank you. And that's one of the reasons why, because your thought process is you're taking it a few steps deeper than, oh, I just got something. Let me pat myself on the back. I got evidence. I'm done. That's the right way to do it. I have a device that reverses. It was made by Katie Holte, Stephen Katie Holte of Holte Paranormal. And it reverses anything from a radio, a ghost box. It'll reverse everything. I've gotten words out of it forward. It is uh, one way to try to vet the, what you're getting, but we don't have anything that tells us that spirit speaks in a way that would come to us in reverse. We don't even really know how our voices are getting to them, except maybe what I was saying about modulating currents around us. We don't really know. So it's an innovative thing to try experimentally, but it's not, right. I don't think, to my knowledge, it's not predicated on something going, you know, we found out that everything that comes from the spirit realm is backwards. So we'll just reverse everything. It's a way to vet what you have, right? If you get a forward word. Yeah. I think it's like a debunking thing for the skeptics though. If this is coming in in reverse and making sense, answering yeah. questions, directly correlating to the investigation, you know, it's like, well, how's that possible? That's not a rogue, uh, you know, airwave signal coming through saying that word because this is running in reverse you know it's kind of like a validation thing more than um, the spirits are talking backwards you know i mean that's the way i look at it that's true and it's, it's good to correlate what we get and what we do but as we all know if someone who's they call themselves skeptics but we know that that's if they're if they're hell bent against this stuff they're a believer it's just a different paradigm yeah but they're cynics not, not skeptics for the truth right but if that's what they, if that's how they are, you're not gonna look. It came in through reverse. It's yeah. you know what kind of solution or what kind of answers are you gonna get by doing that constantly? Yeah, yeah we we had our live stream. We had Lloyd um, Arbach on last night. We were talking about skeptics and cynics and true believers. You know, a true believer can not be objective just as much as a cynic is not objective. But a true skeptic will look at all the information yeah. with an open mind before they draw their own conclusion where, you know, a cynic disguised as a skeptic is going, ah, nah, nah. I'm not even going to look at that because it's impossible. That's right. not a skeptic. That's, that's a, somebody pretending to be a skeptic. And we don't need that. We need people who are willing to look at all the evidence, all the documented work because it's out there. Mm -hmm. Right. And make their, you know, they still don't agree. At least I would admire them for looking into it rather than just, ah, that doesn't work. Yeah. They, like they, with they, ITC, like, oh, I would never use that radio. That doesn't work. Have you used right. it before? Well, no, I would never do it. No, they take, they take the title skeptic because believer has negative connotations that you're naive and, and you buy everything for one. And for two, it has societally and socially it has more of a, of a lofty educated well-to-do kind of a, a connotation to it so they they go that route but what they use to shame people or, or to put the stuff down is, is is science they say it's science but when you're telling me that something doesn't fit into the accepted paradigm and therefore it is it is useless that's not science that's scientism and that's different science looks for absolution it bounces it off peers you keep going till you have some kind of answer and if you don't it stays unknown Right. Well, you know, what I would like to really see change uh, in the field is more collaborating of the data behind all this development of equipment and devices, sharing that data amongst everybody who are developers on how we can better improve the equipment we're using and learn from each other more of how can we get those solutions and answers to how these are working 
sense. And, you know, like if we could collaborate those ideas a lot more. And unfortunately, you get the guys who are like, like Philip said, you get the guys who are just, you know, in it for the money. And I get that, you know, they want to make a living off it, whatever. That's why that's, a, you know, that's them, you know, that's their thing. But then you have the researchers and, and you know, the people who are in it for the research. And it's hard to share that stuff when nobody wants to share that stuff. And I find it's kind of difficult to get some of that data from people. Could you imagine if we all collectively shared what we had right now, we probably already might be very much closer to an answer. Right. The team that I was on uh, several years ago actually formed the Paranormal Data Collective, I think is the name of it, just for that situation for everybody. Just put your information in about locations, you know, tell us what the moon was doing that night, the temperatures, you know, so we could all share it. But nobody does it because it's too much work. People yeah. are too lazy. We're just too lazy. And yeah. that's why we're not getting together and collaborating. It's like, oh, my God, I've got to go through 40 hours of video. And then you want me to, like, punch all this stuff in and, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, okay. Oh, I was going to say everyone's motivation is different too because yeah. you have people that are truly seeking answers. I got into it, probably Philip, because spirits are talking to us and we're thinking, mm -hmm. why does this keep connecting <laughs> with what is happening around me? Uh, then you've got a thrill seeker group who yeah. it's a very short hobby, good for a week, a month. Um, and so with the different motivations and stuff, like he says, you, you, if you're committed, you'll put in some time and some research and some effort and to, um, your own, uh, recordings and data that you have taken down and everything, but to start comparing and sharing and everything it, you really have to have, um, a deeper motivation that would be like a team that's paid on an hourly wage to you know to to put all this together and everything because yeah. we we've got to go to our jobs and feed the family and another yeah. thing is people don't want their evidence criticized i yeah. found even team members within an own their own team sometimes don't want their what they think is evidence criticized for somebody else especially outside teams Oh, that's not that. That's not that. And so we just kind of keep it all to ourselves. We may throw some stuff on Facebook, but, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff my team has that's never been put out. It's just like, first of all, it's private, you know, clients' homes, but, you know, we don't need people to, oh, that's such and such. No, we know. I mean, we know what we're doing, but. Um, right. And it, people, it, it people can be don't like it, it, even the private stuff can be anonymously disclosed if, if, the, if it's possible per evidence to, to do that. Um, the, yeah. You nail a great point with that too, because that's that's part of the shaming process. It also happens. We have to be community minded. Is one of the things we don't we don't we don't approach our own community like like the sh we're our show on Monday nights. Entity voices, paranormal evidence. We listen to other people's evidence every oh, week. Yeah. I, I didn't catch that stuff. That's not my stuff. I'm not going. Hey, look at me. Yeah, but, yeah, I heard something on one of mine. I was like, oh, my God, I didn't hear that. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that was cool. That's, that's an opportunity. We did it. We've had Matt gave us amazing evidence when he was on. Philip did. KD, you're next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a fun That's a fun show. But the, the point is, is that we're trying to look at the community as, you know, is that it's, it's open arms for us. It's not – we're not the end-all, be-all. I may have the best or the worst stuff out there, and that's based on who's judging it at whatever moment. It's not – it's, it can't be competitive. I mean, what we see week after week after week is is that everybody is getting amazing stuff yeah. in this field. Yeah, and you know, uh, after 20, 25 years in the field, I don't want to get into a mindset where, not that I think I know everything, but that I'm not continually reaching beyond my own boundaries. And so to have other people or team members call out uh something in a situation out of the box that I'm usually thinking in it, you know, after 20 years, I am surprised at how much new stuff I'm continually encountering in the field, you know, and it's amazing. You think, why, wow, this is new, what uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and what so, about? yeah, you, you continually learn from each other, no matter how many years you've been out there. 
My yeah. friend who's watching uh, tonight, he watches our show every Monday night, John Q. Public. He's, he actually lives in the building I used to live in. Super nice, super nice guy. He, he told me we should have Bill Nye, the science guy, on because he, he made a declarative statement that the paranormal and ghosts are not real. I went, I don't think he really looked into it too much if he's saying that. Because if it was that easy to close and shut the case on, on the, the fear of uh, paranormal research, it had been done by now. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem. The problem is, and this is one of the things we have to have a, a mindset from in the community outwards is just because we don't meet a hundred percent burden of proof that something is beyond a doubt paranormal, it's not little league baseball. Like if we don't win that, the other team who doesn't believe anything is real, they don't win by default. It stays neutral. There there's right. an is to prove it on both sides. I say it's paranormal. I have to prove that. Somebody else is skeptical. They don't say it is. They have to prove it is. And if I fail to meet the burden, they don't win by default. That's not how it works. Yeah. We have, we have a question in the chat uh, from Jessica Wilson. I uh, want to give a quick shout out to the people in the chat room real quick, guys. We have, uh, Joseph uh, Camo uh, is in the chat. want to say hello to Joseph. What's up? Uh, we have Jessica Wilson, uh, Wendy Conover. And uh, John Q. Public is in there as well. Uh, Mary Ann Rockleman, if I say her name correctly, hopefully. Sure. Uh, has a question. How do you all feel about using apps and um, apps for use for spirit communication like Signal and uh, necro Necrophonic, uh, etc.? cetera? <laughs> I, I came up with my own app with uh, Jonathan Garraway from Gara Paranormal. So I know what's in my ITC app. And the reason I came up with the app was a lot of people don't have access to a spirit box and some other things they can't afford them. This is a free app and it is only foreign language fanatics all running different. There's three different banks and I've got, I mean, I've gotten amazing responses. So it depends on the app in my opinion. See, but I yeah. like that because he knew what he wanted and he aimed for that and he controlled that environment. Again, keeping those words out of the database yes. like an obelisk. Um, and we beta I, beta tested it with other teams. We said, take this, use it, tell us what you hear. If something sounds like a word, we need to take it out. Like Elite Paranormal took it and used it a lot. And I forget some other teams. And they said, this right here doesn't sound. I said, oh, all right, we'll take that out. So, and then we came up with the final, like, this is what it is. These are the phonetics that we kept in because some were kind of sounded like words. But that makes, that makes sense. That's a, that's a smart way to do it. First of all, every device, whether it's paranormal or an app or otherwise, whatever the gear is, nothing works 100% of the time. No. Right. So to say that it didn't work or it doesn't work, that that actually by definition makes the methodology itself a scientific approach because in order for something, a method used for research to be scientific in nature, it has to be falsifiable. You have to be able to falsify it also. So that by definition qualifies for one, you're vetting what you have by what you're putting into it. And if you believe that spirit can manipulate electronics, maybe the app is crap. Maybe the app doesn't do anything it's supposed to do but they can still use it because they can manipulate <laughs> electronics. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Um, another topic I want to get into, guys, because we uh, pretty much touched a lot of... I see it. See it. Um. <laughs> trying to throw um, a KD. She had, so she had something. She had something. Oh. Oh. I was just going to say, Ron and I were talking about this exact topic today. It came up, and... Uh, we're talking about the phone apps and does the phone disturb equipment? People have tested that out already. Does the phone app um, measure EMF? Yeah. EMF is it measure stuff. anything? Is it measuring anything? Is it making someone a lot of money? Is it for entertainment purposes only? And there was quite a bit of heel digging in today. Mm -hmm. Again, those on the left side, those on the right side, people get an opinion. It works or doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. And then there is, a, you know, they don't need to think about it anymore. I like it. I don't like it. But Ron and I were talking about the back side of uh, using these things and the community out there. It feels like a newer community coming into the field that, desperately wants an easy app form of investigating. 
Yeah. Um, it's a lot cheaper than going to uh, Go Stop or these other places and paying out $300 per piece of equipment. Um, so people are wanting to do one or two or three apps and go to the Queen Mary, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and get the and, best evidence in the world, yeah. And, you know, I'm not so sure, especially if you're not the one creating the app, like in Philip's case, how, how sure can you be that you're not picking up like a spirit box, radio signals, uh, you know, some kind of disturbance that's natural causes and stuff. Um, I, love, and I love that you touch on that because that, that leads to part of where the, the thrill seeker or the short-lived person or the person who's too lazy to, to really do the work or the research, that leads to that personality. And, and part of that is, is that you have to learn and have a level of discernment. You can't let the equipment do everything. When you get something that's vocal, my two governing things off the bat before anything else is timing and relevance. Is it relevant to what I'm saying or what's going on in the environment? Is it timed with that? If I ask, what do you like to eat? And two days later, the box says ice cream. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If it says oh. it in that moment, that's pretty uncanny. And it's at least more probable. It's not proof of paranormal effect, but it's a lot closer than it would be if it happened disjointed. So you have to have some kind of barometer to measure too. Yeah. But if I can also add, um, I think researching how the app actually works and have a little better understanding behind the research of the actual app itself, not yeah. just using it and going out, you know, and just hoping, you know, you get good stuff. But if you understood the data behind the app and what it does, and I think that, that would be a whole step forward, too. Yeah, it's years ago, when I, was, I was naive about some apps years ago and using one, and someone sent me the word banks a list, a printout that she had gotten. And I was like, well, this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> Ghost, dead, die, you know. Right. So, it's but so, but I learned, I, I learned a good lesson. And then I started doing, you know, more homework. But this was years ago. But yeah, you got to know what it is you're using. It's the new car mentality. The people want to sign and drive. They want to just sign. I got it. That's good. That's, that's all I got to do now. I'm good. I just, I just roll into the paranormal and I'll get what I get. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I I um I have watched people I'm investigated with whipping out this necrophonics, which is like almost the number one app right now. And it's very vocal. It's a good way to say. Because it's vocal, we must be having conversations with spirits. And you know, being a sensitive doesn't mean I pick up on every spirit in the area. There could be spirits talking that I'm not interacting with, but I listen to this stuff and the, you know, it doesn't fit. They're not saying ice cream. They're, uh, the, the lit, the person using it is trying to make everything fit. You know, every piece of dust is an orb. It's a spirit. Every vocalization is, uh, not a DJ. You know, it's a spirit saying random things that don't have any context to what you're asking. Yeah. It may or may not be a spirit. It's just it's not evidential enough for me to, you know, lock into that moment. The field, the field is very much like a gymnastics gymnasium. It's yes. wide open. There's a lot of space to move. But keeping yourself grounded, centered with a level of discernment and discipline is the balance beam. And it's not easy to stay there because we all have our own biases even though that's part of the problem Constantine Radova used to say that part of the the problem with assessing uh the equation is that we're part of it we right. have I put a lot of things on our in our ITC group and I say what are y'all here in this what do you you know and everybody will put their different things and it's interesting to see what and it'll be five different people here five different things mm -hmm. but I like to see because I know what I may hear and I'll see if someone else corroborates it or they may all say something different. But I like to get other people's opinions on. And a lot of times, like, I absolutely heard that. Or, yes, it did answer that. But let get a get a group of people and let them listen to your things. Write down what they think it says and, you know, be objective. I mean, be open to being wrong. Right. Not that I'm ever wrong, but, you know, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> That's true. But just 
Yeah. That's half the fun because when you get it right and it's real, it's a high. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that bothers me a little bit is when you have skeptics say, well, it's not, you don't have enough controlled variables or you're, you're not testing it in a laboratory, you know, with, with controlled variables. Uh, the laboratory. I, I know. But what I'm getting at is like when you have these investigations, you can't have a perfect environment for those controlled variables all the time. Yeah. Every environment is different that you're in. Every location is different that you're in. You can't use a lot of that while you're on an investigation. You're not there every day. You don't work there every day. You know, how often do you investigate the same place over and over? You right. know what I'm saying? The energy may be, be different one day than the next day, even with the same people, depending on their mood and what right. they brought in with them. Yeah, it's... And the wind all, and the rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, first of all, that is the environment is the laboratory. So when you have conditions that might be conducive to communication or spirit activity, and then you take the activity out of that environment, that's like taking pieces of the recipe out of the cake, right? That's for one. For two, Marcello Bacci from Grosseto, Italy, who had his radio with the vacuum tubes all removed, all three, he had the power taken out of it. He was brought into a lab where they, where they completely blocked RF signal from getting into there, and he still got voices. So the thing is, and this is, again, when you go with the people who are scientific, not scientific, when, they're, when their core belief is that this stuff isn't real, Bigfoot could hand them their car keys and they wouldn't believe in the guy. That's yeah. just, that's their modus operandi. That's it. This, this, a lot of this stuff has been, has been vetted uh, on yeah. levels like that, and they just, it just doesn't, that's, that's why that's not your core audience. You, you do it for the research and you try to work within the community, but. And for anybody listening, that uh, Marcello Bacci, there are videos of him on YouTube that show all of this. So you can go and look for yourself. He's the ITC yeah. heavyweight champion. And I've never calling seen it. Calling Earth. Was it Calling Earth? Is that? Yes. Yeah. And there is an Italian version, but there's there's an English version one too. So yeah. Watch, even if you don't even believe in ITC, it's a beautiful, when you see the parents of these children that have passed and they're grieving and they hear their voices on the radio, whether you believe it or not, it it just it heals them and that's what it's kind of all about really yeah yeah he never took a dime he never got caught being fraudulent uh il laboratorio a group in italy with physicists and scientists all mm -hmm. they they investigated him for yeah. years and they they found nothing yeah and i like what uh ron has in his bio if you ever read ron yakovetti's bio where he states that you know a lot of that stuff they did predates all the modern spare boxes and sure yeah that we're into yeah. They were ahead of their time and they really set the path for the type of research and, and what we're doing now. But that was kind of getting into my next topic, which is, which I find this an interesting thing. Now I kind of find we're, I mean, we're making leeway with technology. We are getting good stuff We're you know, we're going somewhere, but where are we going with it? I find that, do you think our investigative style our methods today are enough? Are we still using the same style that we used for many years? Are we still stuck in that same place where we're using that same methodology over and over and over? Or are we going somewhere with these new styles and new generation of people that are walking into the field now? What do you can, we, can we jump off of that with Marcello Bacci? Because there, there's a mindset that we have that, that suggests that everything we do is better and superior to that of those before us or our parents or whoever. And that in a lot of cases is not true. Um, he is the ITC heavyweight champion as far as I'm concerned. He got stuff out of the radio that is, to me is unparalleled. I've not seen anything on a TV show that even rivals the direct communication he got through the radio and the amount of hoops he had to jump through to vet his process. So I think part of moving forward or upwards in the field is not forgetting that there's a platform that was laid for us by brilliant people like him, like Dr. Annabelle Cordoso in Spain, people who did, you know, George Meek, um, Ernst Sienkowski, who came up with the name ITC in 1989 to differentiate between what was captured by a device like EVP and where a device actually facilitated the vocal like, like a medium. And then he came up with instrumental transcommunication. Those people have done 
tremendous work to, to not familiarize yourself with it, to not stand on the shoulders of those people to try to advance thing and to start over like it didn't happen because it's in Europe. That's crazy to me. Yeah, going out with your PSB7 is not some earth-shattering, breaking new thing that you're doing. I mean, so learn <laughs> learn where that PSB7 came from a long time ago. And yeah, it'll, that'll knock you down a few pegs. But uh, yeah, there was direct EVP, then, then white noise for audio support, then direct radio voice stuff was being done. There was a software called EVP maker software to use fragmented pieces of sound and then the Frank's box and the spirit. Like, and, and don't get me wrong. Those devices work. I have yeah. spirit boxes and, and excuse me, the whole tape paranormal has probably taken half of my income in the last few months. They're awesome. So they work. But we talked about the discipline before for people to really dive in and do the research. Direct radio voice. When you get something out of the radio, it is mind blowing. But. We listen to static for hours a week, and that's not, I mean, are you jealous? I'm not, and I do it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's boring. But when you get something like that, we were setting up to do a session here a couple weeks ago, and we got up and walked over to go to the kitchen to get something to drink before we started, and the radio clearly said, you're leaving. <laughs> and, we, and we froze. We went, <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. was, it was a, a long-wave frequency with no radio emissions whatsoever. So that's, that's a little yeah. perplexing. And I think people in the paranormal need to experiment more. We always hear the scientific method, the scientific method. Well, you learn, you ex, you discover new things by accident or by experimenting, in my opinion. So yeah. I'm all for experimenting, doing out of the crazy box things, whatever. But the, but what are you looking for with that experiment? You know, most of our equipment is detecting environmental changes. It's not detecting a ghost. So if you're going to experiment, make sure you know what the experiment is for and what you want to discover from it, if that makes sense. That's brilliant. Absolutely. So, yeah. That makes See, sense. In my, oh, in my opinion, um, starting out 20 years ago and, you know, the K2 comes out and everyone is thrilled. Um <laughs> Uh, they don't know what they've got, but boy, it lights up. You yeah, know? Exactly. <laughs> you they're know? here. They're here. Yeah. <laughs> and then to me now, the equipment did advance. And I'm talking about handheld equipment. It may have been some better than others, some more factual, some more um, false positives and stuff. Yeah. But I, it felt like for a decade, equipment that you were holding in your hand and purchasing was advancing and then the switch became what could be on your phone and um it's not that i'm against that and there could be someone out there right now creatively thinking of the next best thing that is actually on the phone yeah. but uh it just feels like um so a little bit of wheel spinning uh, like ron said you know reinventing the wheel a few times and stuff um i think like philip said you're going to have to start thinking outside of the box. If you really want to continue the advancement we did a decade ago, where we were really getting new, exciting pieces to try out that were monitoring different levels of environmental shift um, and trying to decide what was causing that and what was interacting with that. It seems in my opinion that if the focus is only going to be on phone apps, we're going to slow ourselves down. Yes. I, you know, um, so there, there may be some phone apps coming that are going to be, uh, you know, changing the field or something. And that's awesome. But uh, it just for right now, the last five years, it just feels like a lot of not 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 the gain that we got a decade ago. Yeah. I I think that's the marketplace-driven thing we were talking about before. I, think, I really think that's what it is. I, I think some people are genuinely trying to make it work. I, you can't discount everybody, right? Because that's I don't ever like to try to speak beyond what I can substantiate. So I'm sure there's a percentage that are that are well intended to do what they're supposed to do. But uh, I think that the real researchers, the people who really really take this stuff seriously, won't just um, relegate themselves to using apps and stuff on a phone. 
like I, you know, I want to lug my cases out somewhere and do stuff. And I have different boxes and, and the boom box I use for work, right? Like I, I want to use methods that I've seen work, like what Bocce did with director. That's why I do that stuff. We, we have to keep using what works and then also incorporate what's new and maybe even fuse them and then look at the people who are inventing stuff and coming out with new things and, and, and try those and, and follow those experiments. That's all, that's all good. But I don't, I don't think it can, and I hope that it won't just go exclusively, you know, app store based because I, I it's limited by what the, even if the device is everything it says it can do now, it's still a very limited scope. If that's all you're going to work off of. And, they, and we have multiple pieces of equipment to, to corroborate evidence. If it's all in the one piece of equipment, can yeah. it still corroborate everything in one unit? Maybe. And it's also knowing how your equipment works, what it's capable of and what it's not capable of. Just like a K2 meter, it picks up Wi-Fi signals, car fob signals, yeah. remote control signals, all these things can make that sucker light up. I mean, yeah. so it's useless if you don't know that. Right. And like our ghost ed group, we did a whole presentation on the um, popular paranormal equipment. When over at like the SLS, every TV show's got an SLS. I mean, it is fun, but if you don't know, the only way that you can use an SLS and if anything happens on it for it to I even think valid, you got to place it six feet from a blank wall on a stationary tripod or a stand with nothing between the sensor and the wall. And if a figure walks by, I'll be like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> but when you're going around the room and, oh, my God, there's something in that chair, it's like it's mapping the chair, people. Right. It doesn't know that's our arms and legs. It doesn't work that way. But I think. Uh, I was going to say, I just think that's frustrating to me. And, and I have to let this go. I cannot educate the world. I try, yeah. but um, they will post the SLS and they're very excited. I don't want to take away the enthusiasm, yeah. but when they have, you know, the little boy spirit is, you know, jumping on the chair and, you know, then he's uh, doing jumping jacks and tap dancing and stuff. It's very unlikely. Um, I, you know, maybe spirits do show up and start tap dancing, but, uh, you know, it, like you say, the, the, it came from the Wii box, the exercise yeah. box, and it's programmed to make those people out of the um, perpendicular lines it's seeking. Yeah. Uh, people right. don't understand that and they're thrilled to get. A false positive in my opinion you yeah. know and and they don't want to hear that it's not real no. <laughs> so, I know, so. my team uses one i think they're fun and of course i had to get one as soon as they came out but like i said you have to know how to use it and know what those false positives are yeah we, we had not, one yeah. matt matt has a, a location in new jersey um that he he runs stuff out of called kingsland manor and uh, one of our friends, Giuseppe, had a, an SLS stuck on a camera on a tripod, and it was aimed at a bar, and there was not mapping anything. It was still the whole time. And I was sitting on the stool of the bar. There was nothing else in the frame except me in the bar. And then he saw something appear, and he asked me to put my arm out. And long story short, it ducked. It went under my arm, which if it was a false positive, it wouldn't have reacted to my movement. So, I mean, is that absolute proof? No, but it is really, a, it elevates the level of difficulty in trying to explain yeah. it away. The SLS was stationary to begin with, and it had, yeah. you know, the environment, it, it was all settled. There wasn't anything moving in it. You weren't carrying it around and moving. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's a little more valid than just walking around with it. And yeah, I saw that video. It, it's uh, very compelling. Uh, mm -hmm. They had it on uh, the one with Tony Rathman, their um, yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. And it's true. It's sitting there for a long time and then it shows up and then it does react second for second to him moving out towards the area where it is. It's ducking, you know, yeah. so he doesn't smack it in the face. <laughs> and so, you know, we're not always going to get an answer every time we have a piece of possible 
evidence. We right. may not ever know yes or no definitively, but we can certainly take things like that moment and say, you know, that is worth researching, logging, exploring and everything instead of everything is evidence and everything goes in the yes box, you know, yeah. It, yeah. like you said, discernment. And, and it, that's the best advice I can give to people I talk with now is, uh, you know, some natural causes, some rational thinking, a little bit of discernment. It might help you. But you were, uh, you were an influence on me when I was newer in this field. I'm not in this as long as, as you are. And when I was starting out in the first few years in California, you were one of the people that I watched and who, who was very thorough and educated and, and preached doing things a certain way for, you know, like you're saying, for, for vetting your, your surroundings and knowing what you're doing and what's false. And, and so that was one of the early influences I had to, to, to look at this stuff and not just put everything in the yes box. So the environment right. controlling it is a, is a huge part of it because if, if something or, or, or someone from a different realm or, or continuum or whatever it is, is, is trying to, is willfully trying to, to be heard or known or picked up on in our realm and in our space time, one would think they would have to avail themselves of, of energy because that's what we're programmed to pick up and we're to feel, to, to sense, to manifest with energy, electrical sound sensory. That's what we're wired for. So you would think they would have to tap into that with, Devices running, measuring different things, that's part of what the toys are for, is to, to corroborate temperature drop, barometric pressure increase at the same time, an EMF thing went off. And again, it's not it's not 100% proof because when it comes down to it, even if you have an amazing preponderance of evidence, if the person who's deciding if it's absolute proof is on the other side of the belief spectrum where they believe everything's caca, which is Spanish for caca. Um, <laughs> it's not going to sell. It's not going to sell them. I like to translate for my bilingual person. <laughs> but what's paranormal? Paranormal is something we cannot find another logical, explainable explanation for. Yes, We're sir. not saying that was a ghost because my REM pod went off. Right. Sir. What else made it go off? We've already done EMF baseline readings. We already know where the that the Wi-Fi is over. We already know this. So why did this go off? And I like to pair multiple pieces of equipment together because if one thing's going off and another thing's going off and another thing's going off, it's a little bit more compelling than your K2 flickering. Nothing else. Right. Can you imagine if you had a team show up and five people were holding five cell phones? Yeah. You know, that's what I'm, that's my fear of where we're going. It's like, yeah. please, please, you know, yeah. um, yeah. you know, a, a team showing up at because we do primarily um, private residences yeah. where people are frightened something's going on in the okay. home. And if you had five strangers walk in your house and you do or you don't watch the TV show, so you're either aware of what it should look like or you have no clue, but they pull out five cell phones. And they have these little ghost radar, you know. <laughs> There's a dot in the corner. There's three dots yeah, in the yeah. corner. That's not evidential. You know, that's, yeah. that's a piece of equipment functioning as it's been programmed. That's it, but, but like Philip says, I need comparison with other pieces. You know, I need my spirit box to say what the um ovilus is saying mm -hmm. which i've had happen about four times and yeah. that that was interesting mm -hmm. you know i need the rim pod to be going off uh you know when i'm getting an evp and and things like this so um having five phones is not going to be helpful to me and the way i'm approaching trying trying to contain this in some sort of um uh, mini lab, uh, you know, ethereal lab I'm creating on the go at someone's home here and stuff. So that's where my thoughts go to. Yeah. By, by the way, on that whole bringing stuff into the lab, uh, astronomy, sociology, um, there's a handful of them. They, they don't bring planets into a laboratory to examine them. So bringing it into a laboratory does not a scientific method make. 
Yeah. If you ever heard of uh, the CERN organization, they would try to do that out of anybody. <laughs> yeah. Look up, look up the Philip experiment for something kind of similar where they created a spirit that the right. group did. Right. Yeah. That's very interesting. The, it's, yeah. uh, it's on YouTube. Well, you could read about it also, but the video, the Philip experiment, it's not about me. It's long time. Uh, ago. But, uh, <laughs> um, but I have this, this group manifest a spirit but is it their pk is it their psych psychic ability creating the ghosts that's creating the phenomena yeah it's very interesting yeah. which you know are we creating some of the phenomena when we go into the location wow. have you heard of the bob theory it's along the same lines if you take a group of people to a location and you tell them bob passed away here yeah and Bob was suicidal, and and Bob this and Bob that. They are going to find evidence to support your story, and what they don't know yeah. is it's a false story you've just given them. Mm. So they've done this Bob theory at a couple of places, and people find evidence. Mm. Poor Bob, you know, he's coming through. He is very sad today, and <laughs> and uh, it's it's interesting, you know, yeah. what the you create. The nineteen oh four did control um, investigations where the team, you know, we always had uh, the intake person, the case leader, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot, most of the time the team going to investigate did not know the activity. That's just the way we did things. And, you know, we'd go to, you know, an investigation, oh, we're going to be here, blah, blah, blah. And it may be a control experiment where the case manager and the team leader knows there's no reported activity in this location. We've got somebody to let us use the, you know. But the thing was, you know, being, you know, a medium, <laughs> I'd always get, you're being duped, you know. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so we got to one once and, you know, we're in and I was like, I know what's going on in here. So it's good if you can get your team to do that, do control investigations where the team members do not know there's no activity reported in this location and just see where their mindsets are. Yeah, I prefer to go in the cold. Thing. Yeah. Years ago, we wanted to know every possible thing. We wanted every team member to know every yeah. possible thing so we could assure that we were all in the exact controlled frame yeah. of mind. And that is a very limited blinders on way to go into an investigation. Yeah, and right. now I'd rather, you know, uh, go to, if you were to go to the Basilica ax murder, if you're going to uh, Lizzie Borden home, I know some of the history, but I would not want to know the minute details to tell if I was actually picking up. Yeah. Because if I know the full story, there's no way to verify uh, com better that, yeah. you know, things are coming through that way. Yeah. yeah. And so there's a level of honor and respect that, that you have or don't have in the community that goes part and parcel with that also, too. Because you know what you don't know and then you're picking stuff up authentically, right? But the people who don't buy into anything are not going to believe you. They think, you know, you're two seconds away from Google. Yeah. Right. Who knows? So, again, you, you do this for vetting the quality and the legitimacy of your process, not to prove this to people who need something to be proven to them, for one. And there's something that's called, and, and I think it's in, in parapsychology, it's called psi-mediated instrumental responses, which is your your mind will steer you towards to have a bias. Yeah. It'll, or it'll steer you away from something or vice versa. So knowing those things going in, that could be part of the problem where you're gravitating towards the Bob thing because now you're looking for it. And that's yeah. part of that, which is, you know, part of the problem, I guess, but there's a certain level of information with some you know, locations like the Lizzie Borden house. It's hard to not, you know, you'd literally have to be one of those people who goes, yes, I actually was living under a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, good point. Um, Sherry, uh, Sherry Rathman is actually in the chat. I want to say hello to her real quick. She she wrote something in there that said, um, actually, Sherry, <laughs> I just got, I just got my shirt and my hat from them today. They are awesome people. The Rathmans yeah. are, are family. Love them. Entity Voices, uh, Paranormal Evidence podcast every Monday night on KGRA Network. Check them out both on uh, Facebook and YouTube. Giving you guys a nice plug there. 
Um, and uh, anyway, uh, she said there in the chat, uh, would it be possible that using spirit boxes can communicate not only to the spirits uh, uh, or from the other side of the universe? Um, that's kind of leaning into my next topic. After all the research that you guys have done, you know, uh, collectively as individuals or with your team, aside from your psychic abilities, but as far as using the equipment and going into a location and using this equipment to kind of research what are we actually dealing with at this point in your life, what do you think of the theories that, that are out there, which is a lot of them? I've got it all figured out. It's it's, it's all the communications are coming from uh, one guy named Phil in Dubuque. <laughs> That's it. There's no ghosts. There's no app. Nothing. No, no, no. It's from Jupiter. Haven't you seen 2001? <laughs> Space Odyssey. Space Odyssey. Yeah, right. I love that movie. Well played. Yeah. Well played. I'm sorry. We cut off your question. No, it's all right. At this point in time in your life, you know, with all the research that you guys have done, using the equipment you've done, um, what do you think at this point, what theory do you lean towards the most of what we have actually going on? What are the possibilities? Which are a thousand of them, but <laughs> I think I know what you're asking, so I'll start. I just lean towards um, something that's always been going on, um, and culturally, religion, and other aspects have controlled the amount of chatter about it. I think mm -hmm. there's always been. Um, a here and now living situation and then an afterlife. That's my personal belief. Um, and that through time, there are um, different um, validations of that. You might see um, the, what are they called? The petroglyphs, um, mm -hmm. the, you know, written and stuff. Um, other, other written works, hundreds of years old, thousands of years old people responding to possibility of spirits and stuff. Um, and then you fast forward into different people bringing it to the forefront. And then um, does society allow us to talk about it? 20 years ago, I could not share this with my work or they would call me into an office and have a severe discussion about their, yeah. their image, you know. Now, 20 years later, not as much of a, a deal. Still have to watch who I share it with. Um, right. oh. My father still calls it witch hunting, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's, there's there's some mind. Of course, he's, you know, from an older generation. But um, I think we're dealing with something in a more modern way. That's something that's been around. So is that leaning towards your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a great answer. Thank you. And this this stuff has been this stuff has been going on way 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 back. Lincoln had seances in in, in the White House. Socrates was known to to consult the Oracle. I mean, this it's Socrates. it's been going on. Socrates from Bill and Ted. <laughs> but it's been going on. It's, it just it was under a negative hail, right? It was something to be to be judged for. There's your one of your upsides to television and the media that's exploded with it. Um, it's more acceptable to talk now to talk about it. Uh, I get, I still get the. You don't tell me you believe in ghosts. I went well. Define ghosts for one, because if you think it's something that's just cut and dry, then you're already not really putting any time into what you're asking me. And, and then I don't. For me, this is not a belief system. That's what I tell everybody. It's not. This is not a belief system. It's not what I believe. To me, this is empirical evidence, empirical experience. That's it. I have an opinion. I have uh, anecdotes and theories based on what I've experienced, what I've read that's been done. But I don't know with absolution that I'm right about any or all of it. And it's, it's, not, um, it's not hearsay for me. It's not something that, I, you know, that I'm just was spoon fed. So I have a belief, well, that can't be true or that can't. That's not most people who have those kind of staunch positions don't have any empirical experience. They haven't, they haven't done anything. Well, ask them if they believe in Jesus. And if right. they do say, well, Jesus was the greatest medium of all times. He right, communicated right. With God, the spirit in a different realm. So how do you not, how do, how are you disputing what I'm doing? If, if you can believe in that, but you can't believe in what I'm doing. Yeah, it, 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 it really goes, stumps them. 
it goes against core beliefs too. And and yeah. to me, the more I get into this, the more I find that that I think that the diamond in the in the rough is in the details. Like you hear, you know, people we were looking to see is there life after death. Uh, we're looking to see if there's an afterlife. And for most people, especially that don't do this stuff, those are very interchangeable terms, right? It's pretty much sounds like the same thing, but there is a, a difference uh, theoretically in, in what we do between those two things. An afterlife is, is, is a location or a place, right? When you die, your soul, if it leaves your body, that's where it goes. It's It's got a location-based connotation to it. Life after death is, is, is a continuity of our existence that if it happens, goes to the afterlife. So for most people, that's something that they wouldn't even think about if they don't do this stuff. But the more you, you get into this stuff, the more you realize that we don't know. And then the more if you're really driven, you really you keep consuming from those who have been before us. And then some of the brilliant people who are coming up with new methods and technologies and doing amazing research. Then you look at those people, too. But there's so much opportunity to learn and to, to have a better understanding you know, do I think the whole world will ever be holding hands singing Kumbaya going, yay, there's ghosts? Probably not. It's, it's like trying to get the planet to all root for the same football team. It's really not going to happen. But, you know, at least at least the, the needle's been moved. As far we as have to be possible. open to the, the thought of parallel universes, that there's something going on right beside us that we can't see that's just as real as this is. Yep. Uh, quantum physics. There's so many things in science that we have we're not advanced enough to discover yet. Spot on. Say in the future that was like there are no ghosts. It's a whole different universe over here in lane two that I can't <laughs> see. We don't, we don't know. I mean, that's no. That's that's spot on, man. The people we don't know. Is, that's the other thing. Science scientists can be biased just because they're they're scientists. They don't get. Yeah. Of, of absolution of authority they don't know sometimes they're people too and they may know and still have a bias and say no you know, my my tenure is on the line i can't really speak to that the people who are so skeptical that they say eventually science explains all this caca away and it's not real that's not science that's promissory materialism to suggest that science and one day will just dismiss all this stuff that's not true either that's not going to happen as well and it may just as well prove it as it would dismiss it that's you know that's where they need it also yep uh, we, I, like Katie, being a medium, we don't really need proof. Sometimes, <laughs> like we know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, which That's... is, you know, the problem when you're trying to be a, an authentic paranormal researcher investigator. Even though you may be going into an investigation and you've already got information, you still need to do your due diligence of. All your scientific things, your your EMFs and your carbon dioxide rate, you know, all that stuff. But it's like, oh, I already know somebody, you know, grandma's over here. And so it's a fine line for, with people that do have abilities that you've got to, you can't just rely on that because I can't prove to you what, how, what I'm saying to Aunt Minnie, you know, other than, you know, she said the gold necklace is under the rug. Those are the only ways we can prove that, but we can't do it with readings on machines. So we have to do it all, you know, if that makes any sense. I'm rambling. No, part, of this is, part of this is also fear-based. I do a lot of mediumship readings and mm -hmm. people are asking me, exact. tell me exactly what happened to my father when he passed away and exactly where is he and they're envisioning a person yeah. in an earthly shaped body standing yeah. a foot away from them yeah. talking to me and as if I can hear their voice and I'm writing down a recipe that grandma has and um, everything is very concrete for the living here and they want to be sure they're not mad at me anymore and um, they have guilt and, uh, you know, what, how long are they here and how come they're not visiting me and, uh, you know, where are they going when they're not going to be here and, and things like this. And I get impressions and I get many repeatable impressions that kind of starts leaning me in a certain direction. Like, oh, this seems to be a norm, but again, I have no concrete proof yeah. I can have people repeat back to me, oh my gosh, there is that gold chain under the rug, you know, mm -hmm. and 
and stuff. And so it's sort of a knowing um, and stuff. But um, when someone passes away, the living family is very fearful for uh, due to their cultural and religious upbringing, what's going to happen to them and stuff. And um, they want mediums to, you know, make them feel better and everything. When I'm out investigating the Queen Mary and I don't know them personally, I don't know those spirits, I don't know their families and everything. It's a, it's um, the emotion has been removed out of it and stuff. And yet the people I'm investigating with are still bringing their cultural and religious biases in yes. and stuff. So mm -hmm. there's this, there's this underlying fear of please find the answers that make me feel better. Yes. And, and we may or may not, you know? Um, and so that kind of biases the way people approach and how they hear the information coming out of um, the different investigators mouth, you know? Yeah. It's hard to explain to a sitter who's wanting to know why their mother did this and died, but that spirit may not want you to know, and they may not care at this point. A lot of people say, well, why don't these spirits tell these, these mediums and psychics who the murderer's name was? <laughs> you know, I was in a, in a, a lecture with this very well-known um, medium who does a lot of work with police and, you know, who killed them is not important at the point where they are. Revenge is the last thing on their mind. They are moving on and their soul is growing. That's what it was meant to do when it left. I mean, they may can give you some clues, but, you know, I had a friend that was murdered about three and a half, four years ago, and I have tried and tried getting in touch with him. And finally, he, I, he said, it's not important anymore. <laughs> and I was like, you know, yeah, it's not. I mean, whoever did it, they will have to deal with it in their afterlife because it was never solved. So that, some of the skeptics that Ron was referring to, skeptics or non-skeptics, um, a lot of oh, uh, some people <laughs> have fear attached to um, if there's ghosts, what does that mean from everything I was ever told growing up, yes. you know? What are they doing here? I don't want to. I don't want to hang out at the Queen Mary. I want to go on to you know wonderful golden places and stuff. So, why are they lost? What? How can I avoid that? You know and stuff. And so there's a there's a level of fear that uh, we come up against and stuff. And um, it's Absolutely. it's unknown. And you know. It's like you're talking about a disease. You're a doctor and you're talking about a disease and you're saying, I just don't know, you know. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. look good. <laughs> yeah. It's here, but... Plans, yeah. 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 Do, you, yeah. do you guys think that religion and science or technology is holding us back like from advancing further into finding more things out? Do you think it's holding us back as, as potential? No. I, I think it's, it's, it's easy to scapegoat religion. Uh, I don't think they're holding us back. There are people within the, the, the churches in different religions that absolutely have their finger on the pulse of, of what we're doing, of what's possible. Um, they've gotten wire recordings on, on of Gregorian chants with EVPs early, early on. Um, there's, a, there's a concept that, that church... Mine seized up for a minute. Yeah, I see. <laughs> But it's a good pose. Yeah, you're good. You're not yeah. weird or anything. Yeah. <laughs> we can, we is, can hear you. So. But you know, a lot of the scientists yeah. doing the work aren't religion, are religious, because they wouldn't be scientists, a lot of them, to begin with. I've I found it's like, I don't believe in heaven and hell, you know. So that's not holding them back. Like my family yeah. would never dream of asking me about going on an investigation they do not discuss what i do they don't they don't ever ask me about it because it's heaven or hell or it's the devil yeah uh, so, my dad finds it fascinating that i do this yeah not, no not my family they no, just don't mention it you could be you could be religious and still be a, a scientist because yeah. scientists are supposed to be using scientific methodologies to try to find answers and experiment and stuff like that. It has nothing to do with your beliefs religiously. I mean, there could be crossover. People think that these things are, are supposed to be two separate things because 
it goes it goes way back if you look back in, in history from like 1545 i think to 63 in italy in the area called trento there was something called the council of trent it was it was a, a huge ecumenical gathering it was it was a an anti-protestant movement reformation movement that the catholic church did and they just basically said you know that's the stuff that's all measurable and quantifiable and the stuff that you can feel and touch and see, but that's all science that's you guys everything that's of the spirit and of the aura and the, oh, that's us and so ever since then it's been like these two things are not able to coexist in the, but they are there really is a lot of stuff that overlaps like philip said the word spirit appears in both paranormal supernatural research it appears in in a variety of different religions you see the word spirit so it's not you know we don't we don't really know but i don't personally i wouldn't scapegoat religions as holding us back i think i think we live and die by our own sword in this in this field and if you're if your methods are, are th scientific and if you do quality work then you're doing something positive but yeah I don't, oh, go ahead, huh? i was just gonna say i don't think i think because people are moving away from um organized I don't want to say moving away. In addition to organized religion, there is also people embracing a more open, wider spiritual uh, yeah. connection or mm -hmm. a way that they definition, way they define themselves. I don't think that it now in modern times it is holding up. Let's read her mind. What's she saying? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, as long as uh, you're a scientist and you don't let your religious beliefs be biased to your research, then yeah. But oh, there she's back. Yeah. Hello. Welcome back. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I think my Wi Fi is having fun here or something. That was mine last <laughs> night. So yeah. It's playing Jedi mind tricks on you. Well, what I find fascinating is um, with all the shows on TV and everything, um, where, do, where do they go from here? Because 10, 15 plus years ago, there were two shows on three. There was Paranormal State with Brian Buell, Taps, and the English girl lady that screamed all the time. I loved her. With Derek. <laughs> Julia Childs? Yeah. With Derek yeah. Okora. Uh, and that was the only three on TV. And if you were not sincerely into the field, you didn't even know those shows were on. Yeah. And now, you know, everybody's friend has been on My Ghost mm -hmm. Story, A Haunting, right. uh, Paranormal Cut on Camera. Oh, wow. You know, I mean, yeah. Paranormal like State still shows. one of my favorite shows of all times, Paranormal State. That was still I, one of my favorite I shows. I love that show. Yeah. I love that show. Yeah, it was good for it. There were no demons. Like, oh my God, did you hear that? It's a demon. There was there was none of that. It was, but that would not get ratings today after people have been seeing what they've been seeing. Yeah, I that, love that. I know. It's sad. Yeah, yeah. There, it it's sad that the media had to take it in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, that's, that's the paying the price for for the the perks of the media, right? If it wasn't for for television and the media, this stuff would still be a lot more taboo. It wouldn't yeah. be as open, and there wouldn't be as many people doing this stuff that are doing good work. Wouldn't be involved, right? So you you know, places, historic locations benefit from revenue streams they wouldn't have before because sure. yeah. ghost hunting teams come in and rent it out. So that's so there's upsides to it. But the downside is, is is what when I lived in Hollywood, we called the golden rules. It's he who has the gold rules. And if if they're if they're making the productions and they're making the things, they everything is sensationalized. The news is, is sensationalized too. It's everything, yeah, it's 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 clicks and likes and, and getting people to tune into whatever you're doing. So unfortunately, you know, if, if you get a couple of blinking lights on a K2 meter, that's not gonna keep people from putting the food network on. However, if Satan is making a cordon bleu <laughs> yeah. and your ass is on fire at the same time you're cooking some chicken, then people go, holy crap, look, it's a demonic cooking show. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, there, there is some good that comes out of the TV shows. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's helping the field pioneer to become better 
Um, what can we do better than what they're doing? And it's giving the public more awareness of what we're doing. Um, and in a way, that's, I think, is a good thing. But it's not the thing that it bothers me. It does such a disservice to some of the historical places because they give out wrong information because so many of the stories have been embellished about these places that just aren't true. And it keeps getting passed on and passed on and passed on. And that's why I'm such a big uh, proponent of doing your own research, even if you're going on one of these fun uh, thrill seeking like you know, if you're going to Myrtle's plantation, do the real research about the oleander poisoning and all that, you know, that was probably, you know, yeah. something else instead of being poisoned, you know, just do your own research and find out the real, the real facts. I mean, they're usually pretty good, but they're not as crazy as some of the stories are. Yeah. Well, exactly. that's like the Queen Mary has the room B340, I think it is. Yeah. It's $500. It's $500 a night, uh, and it's not haunted. It, it was owned by the Disney company um, for promotional reasons. They set it up to be part of tours. They created a backstory. Yeah. Um, then, you know, and then it kind of faded away. Disney let go of that, and then when the Queen Mary is scrambling for additional funds, they brought the story back out and started charging $500 a night. And people are meeting TV celebs at Paracons on the Queen Mary and going into that room and the TV celeb is getting all kinds of evidence. And the fan club is sitting there saying, ooh, ah. And it's, um, it's not helpful if you really want these people to explore you know the, sure a ghost might slip into the room i mean the queen sure. mary's got ghosts wandering all over you know yeah. that room could be haunted on occasion but not um daily hourly the way that they're promoting it and stuff and it's frustrating you know what room what room number is it again <laughs> b3 b340 i believe Three, four, yeah, I think that's what it is. Do you remember, do you know uh, the gentleman who does the, the, the investigation tours before the world got shut down? Uh, Matthew Schultz of yes, Power Yeah. Do you remember what he called that room? Because he would do the investigation tours with the public and he would walk by and he would dispel that whole Disney story and he called the room BS 340. <laughs> that's <laughs> a bunch of BS in there. <laughs> Sounds like a bingo card. Yeah. <laughs> so. Guys, we're uh, 10 minutes away from uh, closing the show. I want to leave enough time for everybody to get their information out to our audience that's watching the show. Um, we'll start with Katie Foreman. Uh, Katie, uh, anything coming up, events, website information you want to share? Um, give any shout outs. You know, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so there's this virus that's slowly going down. And. Uh, so a paranormal conference that was supposed to be last year has been bumped out to October this year. It's in um, Vulture City, Arizona, old mining town. Uh, Marie and Jay Yates put it on with their paranormal group. Um, it'll be in the first weekend of October of this year. We're a guest speaker there. It's got about 13 very intact buildings. An old man built a mining town, no longer used, extremely haunted. John Zappas is going to be there. He's the headliner. And a um, lot of good speakers and low fees, great investigation. So if October looks good for you to travel, definitely look into Vulture City Paracon. Hmm. That's that's my plug. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Philip? Well, my team since uh, COVID has been, you know, laying low but three of us so far have been vaccinated with our first shot <laughs> so as soon as we're all vaccinated we hope to get back into some homes to help some people but you know doing residential investigations during a pandemic is not the smartest way to go no. we've helped a lot of people all over the phone and you know through other other means but physically we haven't gone to their homes um so I've concentrated a lot on Ghost Education 101. You know, we give the wonderful presentations every other um, Wednesday night, twice a month. Um, we had great, great one last night with Lloyd, our back, which was just, 
you know, I could talk to him for weeks, you know. Um, so our next one is in two weeks. And honestly, I can't remember what it is. Um, but check those out. It's really, really a good place for real information. We try our best to bring you the truth. You know, it's fun, too, and some scary stories. But we want people to get the facts and not, um, you know, the SLS mapping out a little boy in a chair kind of thing. <laughs> and my team, my Facebook team page, you can find it um, in cap. You can see some of our, our work, our videos. Of course, we kind of make them scary just to get people to watch, but it's some good stuff. Of course, it's got good stuff. It's got Philip on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the real Philip project. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Yakovetti, the Yakman, what do you got going on? Yes, sir. So, uh, so Lourdes and I have uh, an ITC research page on Facebook called uh, ITC The Invisible Art. Um, we have Gagnac Paranormal website, which is almost going to be launched. Uh, the very talented Mr. Matthew J. Haas uh, helped us design it and put the site together. Um, masterful job. So we're excited to finally have a website up. And then all considered, if everything stays in a nice, you know, positive trend, um, we're to run an ITC exhibit at the New Jersey Para Unity Expo in September. Um, it was supposed to be, yeah, I can get bumped like three or four times from when it was originally supposed to happen. So, um, which is an honor. And we're, so we're looking forward to that. And then we definitely want to get out to the West Coast and to the South. We want to work with Philip. We want to work with Katie again. Um, definitely the Queen Mary. And, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. That's good. Um, any last words before we close out the show um, on our topics that we talked about or things that you wanted to throw in there real quick? Uh, any last, any last rights? <laughs> no, we love, I'm just, I just hope that people will embrace learning about the paranormal and doing it the right way because it's so much more rewarding when you, are educated and you know what you're getting. Cause when you get something amazing, it's like I said, it's the greatest high, like getting cursed out on a spirit box <laughs> with some really nasty words. I mean, just gets me just high as a kite. <laughs> we had some really interesting ones the other night. Right? Yeah. Uh, with, the, with the new box. Yeah. We, I had, I had something uh, on EVP go, you dick. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's pretty nice to some things I got recently. So. <laughs> I'm with Philip. I say um, use your gut, use discernment, and um, don't just follow TV. Um, kind of get a full range. Just really expose yourself to different mindsets because, yeah. um, you know, somebody out there who is just starting out is going to be our next inventor with something really uh, advancing the whole field. And so we encourage, you know, people to explore and go with what feels right to you and ask questions. And there are lots of people out there that are just willing to help and answer and, you know, whatever. And then take, take what you need and leave what doesn't sound right. You know, everybody's going to get a little different angle on, on the whole field. But don't criticize others for what they're doing. If it's not what you're doing, because it may be working for them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I'll say um, progress is not always forward. Sometimes progress is taking a step back or looking at what happened before you. Um, I, it was a huge lesson I learned from getting involved with doing direct radio voice stuff like a year and a half or so ago is when I looked at stuff like what Bocce got and what Hans Otto Kana got or what the hard fish facts got on computers that weren't network fax machines. Um, the communication that they got a, a, in a direct way without radio emissions or anything is, is, is staggering. So definitely become aware of what's, what's been done, uh, how it's been done. Um, look at the people who were brilliant. Stephen uh, and Katie Holte make amazing stuff. Katie Stafford, Jay Prather, uh, Robert Bandoff from Barefoot Panel. These people are, are creating things or building things. And you know what? If everything they do works or if nothing they do works, they're still moving the ball forward because they're experimenting and they're trying things that they're thinking to do. And so my hat's off to 
So all those people, but to me, what Katie said makes the most sense. You expose yourself to a lot of different mindsets of people. When I started out and in, in, on the West Coast, she was one of the people who I watched when I didn't know a fraction of what I know now. And I learned so much from being around people like that. Matt and, and Philip, I've worked with both of you guys. I've talked to you about different stuff. I've learned from you guys. Um, always as much a student as, as I'm willing to be a teacher. Always. So that's to me, that's there's your pendulum teacher, student right here. Right. You know, help, help. If you can learn, sometimes dip it and listen because there's a lot of stuff out there and there's a lot of really smart people who do this stuff. Yeah. We, I, I always say that we're all students of the paranormal. We're yes. all students. We all got to learn something from each other. And, you know, everybody brings something different to the table and you got to be more open and understanding of that. Right. And the people before us, they brought the table. Yeah. <laughs> they brought the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a high chair trying to get to the table. <laughs> Damn right. Damn right. Me, me too. If, if I could get anything uh, close to what Bocce got, I would just uh, I would like I won the lottery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a great show tonight, guys. I thank you all for being part of tonight's show. Um, I'm going to be doing this maybe like once a month, doing a roundtable kind of paranormal thing uh, each month, you know, trying to get different people on and we'll talk mm -hmm. about different topics, obviously. Um, but I'm going to try to do this more often and see how it goes. And I think tonight went well. Uh, and I, you know, thank you guys for being a part of tonight's show. I really appreciate it. Let us, let us, let us you. encourage your viewers. Let's encourage your viewers to continue supporting and watching your show. Because you built you built an incredible show from the ground up with strange oddities. The guests he gets were I mean, I'm I'm honored to be a part of the lineup that has preceded me in, in weeks that have passed before this with the guests that he's had on. So people should I hope continue to support and, and watch your show. It's a good show. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I'm looking for more subscribers. We're over 130, I think, so it's great progress for a short period of time. Uh, real quick, I'll make an announcement um, for my viewers and listeners. Guys, if you're interested, next week, next Thursday, March 25th, I have the entire Holzer Files crew on the Strange Oddity podcast. Wow. There you go. At 8 <laughs> a whole crew. Not just one. There you go. I mean, yeah, I'm on the D list for this. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what did I just say? What did I just say? Yeah. Yeah. I, he had I, Dave I Schrader on recently. It was a great interview, right? Yeah. I had uh, Dave Schrader on, and Dave was like on the side, you know, on the download. He was like, oh, I'd love to have, you know, my other team members come on your show. And I was like, really? I was like, I guess, you know, it was a great interview for him to say that. And I, and I respected that. And I was like, so I contacted them again, and I was like, "Hey, if you want to bring them all on, bring them all on." <laughs> so yeah, that's that awesome. Good. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. I can't wait. Um, that's about it. I just want to real quick thank our last guest before I close the show, Dr. Brian Regal, who we had on last the last episode. Uh, he was an anthropologist, and we talked about uh, the Jersey Devil uh, and the New Jersey Devil uh, folklore, Pine Barrens area, and uh, we also talked about. Who really discovered America? So it was a really interesting topic. Um, so check that episode that episode out, guys. Um, closing notes of the show: Be well, be safe. Thank you to all the men and women who served our country. I'm very patriotic. At the end of my shows, I want to always make sure I thank all the uh, you know police officers and nurses and doctors and you know all the important people during this pandemic, of course. Um, you know, thank you all for what you do and, you know, much respect to everybody. Amen. So we, all, we all do different things and play our part out there. And I want to thank everybody for that. All right, guys, uh, I'm not playing an end video here. I'm just going to close out the show. I want to thank all of our people in the chat. Don't want to leave them unnoticed. Guys, thanks for the questions. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Uh, if I did, apologies. There was a lot of people in the chat tonight. I want to thank you guys for watching the show tonight. So kudos to you guys, all right? Mm -hmm. Guys, have a great night. And uh, guys, I'll say goodbye to you guys after I uh, end the show. <laughs> all right, take care, guys.